do this is a better place to be over here. Any chance that you can hear me? Give it a try. Uh, my name is Rod Sorensen, W6NAV. Uh, and my program is about uh, subterranean imagery. And also my program uh, isn't the one I wanted to, uh, isn't exactly the one I wanted to present tonight, so it'll be a little out of sequence, so you're going to have to uh, have some sense of humor. But I think it'll go fine. <laughs> anyway, it's hard to imagine when the first people started to wonder what's under the dirt. Uh, I'm betting it was when they were looking for food or maybe shelter. Whatever the case, some of us have been looking under rocks or digging in holes just to find more dirt. Without trying to chronicle the history of digging, it seems adequate to say that we've had a long-standing curiosity for what's buried or where we can't see it. Precious metals, food, water, caves, Uncle Henry's money box, <laughs> last year's potty pit, you name it, we've wondered about it or stepped in it. About 80 years ago, some fellow decided to drive some metal stakes into the ground and blast some electrical energy through it. He figured you could measure the amount of resistance to the electrical current that was provided by the, uh, by the material that made up the terrain. And this information would reveal some of the qualities of that material. Of course, he was right. Different materials such as sand, stone, and clay all have different qualities of resistivity and can be as a, and this can be observed with predictable results. Actual diagnostics with re, uh, re resistivity have been somewhat problematic because of uncertainty which comes from moisture in the soil, combination soils, layered soils, contaminants, these uncertainties add uh, to added to several other uh, shortcomings, which is primarily uh, high cost, have prevented resistivity techniques from being uh, widely accepted by the scientific community. It also takes a lot of equipment. Uh, this is some of the equipment. You can see all the coils of uh, wire. It's battery powered, so the power involved is quite low. It runs cables over a large area. But we can produce uh, imaging of a sort. In this case, this is a section view of a single line of resistivity taken along a levee to analyze moisture content. The dark areas, the, I'm sorry, the dark red areas are indicative of high water saturation in an area which may lead this area here. The value of this type of survey can be seen because only the high risk areas would have to be reconstructed. So if you're evaluating a levee, uh, you would not consider rebuilding these sections over here, but this area you would have to take a much closer look at. Having observed the advantage of resistivity, uh, surveys, the difficulties carrying them out, scientists began to look at the feasibility of using electromagnetic techniques to measure uh, terrain conductivity as an alternative to resistivity surveys. Conductivity values simply being the inverse of resistivity. A transmitter coil is energized with an alternating current, so it'd be at one end of this uh, pole here, let's call it this end here at a very low frequency. We found that frequencies around 9 kilohertz are effective for this type of work. A magnetic field is generate, generated which permeates the free space as well as the soil and rock below the surface. As a result of the magnetic field, extremely small secondary magnetic fields are induced in the earth. A similar receiving coil placed a short distance away, in this case at the opposite end of the beam, uh, is, uh, is designed to sense the secondary currents and the primary current also. 
the equipment is fabricated in a way that perpetuates certain contents in such a way that the ratio between the secondary and primary magnetic fields is proportional to ground conductivity. Instruments are then, uh, then use the ratio to drive a direct reading meter where the ground conductivity is listed in millisiemens per meter. Can we take just a second? I'm going to try to plug a microphone in here. Okay. Let's see how this works. Further, the secondary field, field is separated into two components, an in-phase and the quad-phase components. <laughs> I'll keep talking while she catches up. The in-phase follows the sine wave initiated by the transmitter coil, and the quadrature is 90 degrees behind the in-phase, an indication of the electromagnetic fields in turn created uh, by the transmitted field. So the, uh, the in phase measures the magnetic susceptibility of soils, which is a measure of how easily soil can become magnetized Magnetic susceptibility of soils is primarily dependent on the volume and content of magnetite. In addition, maghemite, a relatively, relatively magnetic form of iron oxide, is produced in highly organic soils. So uh, farming or uh, uh, human intervention would be the source of maghemite. Natural fires or fires caused by human humans or disruptions of the soil activity will result in local anomalies. The in-phase response of the instrument will uh, also act as a metal detector uh, and is sensitive to metal ob objects either buried in the ground or on the surface in close proximity to the surveys. But the biggest single advantage to conductivity uh, systems is they do not require direct contact with the earth. In fact, they perform best at a height of about one meter above the surface. So a person carrying this around or on a cart of some sort uh, would have the best possible function. So when humans live on the land, we leave certain signatures to remain long after the culture has lost the scene. Even when erosion or uh, material deposits cover the, or mutilate the surface, we can still detect the signs. Using the instruments we've just discussed and some new technology, we can discover the homes of those who went before us and other facts about the land. So here is a uh, conductivity survey performed in a landfill area where they detected leakage in the area. The blue area represents native soil, which is probably sandy because it's low in conductivity, around 1 to 10 millisiemens per meter. Uh, the green area represents uh, area of soils which are contaminated with uh, uh, moisture and oxidized material. And the limits of migration are clearly seen along several areas where high rates of flow are carrying the contamination further away down this direction here, perhaps a, uh, a runoff area. So in this case, they're, uh, they have a uh, land, landfill area here. They're getting some leakage of uh, uh, contaminants out the outside of it and perhaps into a stream. So this is the area they need to look at. So 
how are these surveys done? This is the old way. Traditionally, techniques uh, for making geophysical survey will, will be to lay out an area in manageable blocks with lines of tape or rope. Uh, of course, the size of the area and the spacing of the lines would depend on local knowledge of the subject and uh, resolution required. In many cases, 100 meter squares are used with 5 meter line spacing common for fairly good resolution. In any case, a fully documented survey of the location and permanent reference points must be conducted if the anomalies are actually to be located permanently. Most data logging is simply done by handwritten notes. The person taking the survey would start at a corner of the surveyed area along one of the survey lines and note the geophysical data from the uh, instrument along with the notation of the location or the grid square where he's standing. Then he would uh, move to the next location, perhaps advancing five meters, and repeat the process. So this is slow and one of the reasons why it's quite expensive. Once the data is collected, the information can be laid out on a paper grid. Similar values are connected and lines of, are interpolated in a way, uh, the same way that weather maps are created. If the work is detailed enough, then a geophysicist or perhaps a geologist may be able to define certain features within the survey area. But time has gone on and there are certain improvements in uh, in this uh, possibility. We can replace the cumbersome uh, tape grid G with GPS data. Global positioning systems have been with us for some time now. Most of our new handheld units routinely uh, locate positions within probably a foot or two. For those with the technical requirements and who can afford the $58,000 price tag, you can get a GPS which will locate to less than one inch at speeds up to 980 miles per hour. So, uh, oops, I one that actually has a an inch. So this would be the GPS system here. And this is the GPS receiver. In order to use this type of precision, you do require a, uh, a remote uh, type of uh, radio mounted in the area which transmits directly to the rover and gives it the data that it needs to get the uh, extreme accuracy that's involved here. PCs have been a powerful tool for many years now and uh, the uh, portable computer is even common. Of late we can get field grade computers which are tough and, to, tough and to work outside in the field. So the natural progression of our work has been to use highly durable uh, computers to log the data from geophysical instruments and GPS simultaneously uh, to speed up our process. Our first venture into this type of data collection allows us to record GPS posi position and all geophysical data eight times per second without human intervention. And we thought that was good. Another big help has been the development of the all-terrain vehicle. They get around on rough terrain, and they too are very durable. So we don't have the next slide available here, but I can uh, get the information from this one. Uh, so this is our conductivity prototype. It's a modern all-terrain vehicle with the latest high-resolution GPS. It records data eight times per second in rugged field computers. Uh, this is the conductivity instrument back here just like we saw in the earlier photographs with uh, men carrying it. Transmitter coil is mounted on the back and of the white tube, and the receiver is at the front of the tube, three meters from the transmitter. Since the distance from the transmitter to the receiver determines the depth of the data that's collected, we have also added two additional receiving coils at one meter and two meter from the transmitter. So there, Hard to see, but they're underneath the uh, uh, underneath the instrument. 
here. So this gives us additional date, data on uh, mirror surface uh, uh, features. So what can we do with this whole thing? Geological mapping. We can find fracture zones and faults. We can determine soil types. We can find plumes such as plume, uh, pollution or contamination plumes, pollution of uh, groundwater, uh, ground salinity, which is helpful in farming. We can map permafrost. We can do archaeological exploration, utility location, and uh, mined and unexploded ordnance can be located with this type of equipment. Useful for roast Sorry? Useful. Or Roseville. Yeah. <laughs> so here is a uh, survey uh, done by the instrument. In this case, a property owner along Olive Drive here in Davis required an assessment of potential hazards which may be underground. Uh, he was about to start a major construction project and expected delays would be costly. The orange lines that we see here are the paths followed by the ATV with the uh, sensor in tow. And this is the survey that was created. And another point here is that this, this field would, uh, if we were doing 100 uh, meter squares, it would probably take about six days to survey this field. And we did it in about an hour. Subterranean image reveals that there is an unrecorded pipe running across the property. So that's this area here. It actually extends all the way, uh, all the way across. It can also be seen that the pipe is broken, and there's a plume of more conductive material leaking from the pipe. It's been leaking for many years, and the deposits uh, have covered quite a large area. And it turned out to be untreated sewage. <coughs> Here's another interesting one. This is a uh, geophysical study conducted to prove the recorded location of features before construction was undertaken under a street. Uh, the green square in the upper drawing over here indicates the location of a utility bunker running over a sewer channel in the China Basin area of San Francisco. The bunkers contain high power electric lines, gas lines, and communication lines. The survey had to be done between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning to avoid traffic in the city and to minimize electromagnetic, electromagnetic noise. The survey re revealed in this case that the bunker was 35 meters out of the position. So it was really here. And they thought it was here. So they were in a dig in the wrong place. <laughs> Construction problems like this can actually cost millions of dollars, especially in areas like San Francisco, where everything's expensive. <coughs> okay, we don't have the slides for this next one, but we've also worked for uh, uh, Homeland Security down at the uh, border with Mexico. You might remember the news stories a couple of years ago in 2008. <coughs> discovered uh, uh, tunnels under the border. That was us. Uh, and the uh, tunnels, of course, were, uh, were destroyed. They're probably back by now. But, uh, Job security. Sir? Job security. Job security. <coughs> Got to have it. So now we're going to get a chance to see some of the images. Here's our uh, equipment, currently called MSCAN. Our system has been operating in California for 11 years. As a result of our work here, we attracted the attention of National Geographic and Mark Lehner, director of the Giza Plateau Mapping Project. Conversations with him led to the assembly of a team of experts uh, who set off to uh, discover the, or just demonstrate the capabilities of MSCAN in Egypt. So we were working around the 
the basic uh, pyramids here, and I want to talk momentarily just about <coughs> pyramids so that we can uh, talk about uh, where they are and what they're doing. The pyramids were built about 5,000 years ago, give or take a thousand years or so. The pyramid is actually a whole sequence of construction which form the pyramid complex whose sole purpose is to facilitate the transformation of the pharaoh to a god upon his death. The pyramid is built on the west bank of the Nile. This is the area occupied by the setting sun representing death in the afterworld. Most people live on the east bank of the Nile, uh, which is the area dominated by the rising sun representing birth and life. <coughs> When the pharaoh dies, his body is taken across the Nile on a barge, and the body is taken to the valley temple where some religious ceremonies are taking place. So in this case here, the pyramid has a valley temple here with access to the, uh, to the Nile. The Nile in its dry season is uh, sometimes miles away from the uh, pyramid complex. And uh, so they had a series of sloughs that uh, allowed them to arrive at the valley temple here. Next, the body is taken up at Causeway, which is this represented right here, uh, from the Nile Valley to the east side of the pyramid where his body is embalmed. And that takes place in this area right here. When this operation is complete, the body is placed in the pyramid through an entrance on the north side, which would be the back side for a point of view here. The totality of the pyramid complex includes many other features, such as walls about three meters tall, and as many as five boats may also be buried within the complex. So these are the three pyramids, uh, just looked at the other uh, drawing uh, here, 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 the ones that we most often think about when we uh, see pictures of pyramids in Egypt. And they uh, are named for their constructors. Uh, the first one is uh, generally referred to as Khufu. It's the largest of the pyramids. The second one is uh, called Khafra. And it's the uh, second largest, only slightly smaller. The unique thing about this one is that part of the original limestone casing remains on the top of it uh, to give us some sort of a demonstration as to how beautiful it was in its time. The third one is the smallest, called Menkaur. And the interesting thing about it, it was covered with black uh, granite. So it had a decisively different appearance. Other features in the area are uh, this area down here called the Wadi, we would call it a washout. Uh, it's also an area where they feel like most of the stone was quarried for these, uh, uh, for these structures. Uh, the worker village is in this area here. This is where they believe the people who built the pyramids lived. And this interesting feature here called the Wall of the Crow appears to have been designed to keep flash floods coming down the, uh, down the wadi from flooding into the worker village. Uh, this is the causeway for uh, Khufu's pyramid, which has been destroyed at the end, and the valley temple has been destroyed uh, by this encroachment of the city of Cairo, which is here. This is the Mina House Golf Course. Uh, been there since the 1880s. Okay. So these are the uh, transects, or the uh, lines that were actually driven by our ATV. The interesting thing about uh, using GPS positioning is we're now released from the ability to follow, or released from the requirement to follow straight lines everywhere. We can drive almost any angle and uh, still get the required data. And in fact, there are some advantages to a random pattern, although a random pattern is pretty difficult to actually create. 
This is a uh, representation of the area driven over the Wadi. So this is Menkara's pyramid. Up here, down in this corner, would be where the workers' uh, pyramid, is, their workers' area is. And so this would be a quarry in this area. These are what the <coughs> initial surveys look like. We can create them in different uh, appearances, which satisfy our visual requirements uh, for certain uh, types of anomalies. But where we end up with the most advantage is through these uh, three-dimensional views and even four-dimensional, or three, uh, I should say three-dimensional views that we create like this. So this is the uh, query where most of the material was removed. It's been alternately filled in. They've tried to uh, expose it from time to time in order to determine its volume. And about the time they get it halfway done, they start dumping things back in it because they're off on another project. So this is the uh, quarry. The bottom part is indicative of uh, bedrock. The middle part is low conductivity, representing sand. And the top area is higher in conductivity, representing the spoil or the uh, other material that's been dumped in on top of it. But we still were able to get uh, to a calculated calculation of the volume and uh, determine uh, how much rock has been removed from the area. How deep was it from the surface down to the bedrock? About eight meters. Uh, this is the uh, Mina House Golf Course which uh, basically seems fairly uninteresting archaeologically, except that it's an area that's never been evaluated. Uh, it's right at the base of Khufu's Pyramid. This is the way it looked around 1886. And we look back here to find out what it looked like back then. Of course, uh, there were a lot of di uh, different reports. Some thought that the area was marshy and some thought it was uh, sandy and desert-like. Uh, and so we, after surveying, we found that the whole things were true. The green area is indicative of low, low uh, conductivity, which would be a representation of uh, blowing sand from the desert. The yellow area on the opposite side here is indicative of uh, higher conductivity which has a lot of deposits, uh, probably from the, uh, well, certainly from the Nile, representing the uh, westernmost migration of the Nile. So it would have come up to about this point at one time. The features in the black are clay pipe irrigation systems uh, with several large cisterns, probably to uh, manage the golf course in its early years. But then we can do deeper analysis. And we can do this primarily because we have the ability to read at different uh, depths uh, due to the different spacing between transmitter and receivers. And so if we look at one level of this, we can see that the area is uh, scattered with linear and rect rectilinear features. However, due to the course spacing, the survey uh, in this survey, follow-up work will have to be done. But it appears in this area that there's the ruins of a city in this area that haven't been discovered before. This is 3D modeling of the same area, uh, which uh, in this particular, uh, we, have, we call it a vertical feature. It's probably a well and water pipes running through various parts of the, of, the, uh, of the golf course. 3D modeling of the area. This would be indicative of bedrock. This is what we think is probably ruins. And of course, blowing sand, blown sand over the top of it. The workers cemetery. So you remember on the map, we looked at that area that was uh, where we thought that the uh, workers who built the pyramids lived. 
Well, people uh, over this period of time uh, died, and uh, they were buried on the on the same area. So this is the area where they lived up here, and they usually buried them up in the hills on this area here. This is a 3D map of the same process. This area, which is looks like a bite taken out, is uh, this area right here. Uh, that is an excavated area. This is a uh, uh, Egyptian excavation, all Egyptian. Uh, everybody involved in it is Egyptian. And it's under the direction of Zahi Hawass, who is the uh, Minister of Antiquities in Egypt. Our project was to determine the extent of this area, which they're going to expose in the long, in the long run. So we, service, we surveyed the area up here on the hills, which would be this area around. And these are the things that we found. So these are continued tombs. The blue areas are uh, areas that are vacant. They're air voids. Here would be a 3D representation of the same thing. Blue area is indicative of a room, uh, which we can't know what's in it, but we can tell that it's vacant. And the reddish area around it is bedrock. So these are tombs that uh, no one has seen since the pyramids were completed thousands of years ago. We will they will eventually get to those rooms, uh, but I have to tell you they're not in a hurry to get there. They're working very slowly. I'm going to skip this area and go on to the workers' village. So this is the, the uh, let me talk about the workers' village. The workers' village is a well-documented site discovered in 1998 when a woman on a horse fell into it. Uh, lots of this work has been seen on television. So if you've been watching television, Discovery Channel and so on for the last 10 years, this is one of the things they've been talking about over there. The wall of the crow is seen at the top of the drawing. That's this one up here. The bottom of the drawing, uh, the village seems to disappear underneath a football field. That's this area right down here. They don't excavate football fields because they'll kill you. <laughs> because they like football over there. Uh, so tearing, tearing up the football field is not one of the options. But using M-Scan, we were able to determine the extent of the uh, worker village uh, without actually digging a hole in the football field. And we found that it actually does go completely underneath the soccer field and out off the edge here to an area which was occupied by the British Army during World War II. <laughs> uh, and of course we can see the extent of that also. This is the Wall of the Crow. You can see it's, uh, it's probably uh, on the order of four meters tall because that's me standing on the top there. Uh, On the right, this rubble strewn area is the actual end of the Wall of the Crow where it sits today. Lots of the rock has been stolen uh, from this area, and one of the things we wanted to know was how far the Wall of the Crow used to go. So we performed this survey of the entire area. We overlaid the uh, survey that was done by the ground crew there from the 98 discovery. And one of the interesting things we found is that the wall of the crow appears to have gone probably about another 80 meters. It could possibly have gone further because the city of uh, Cairo is here and we could survey no further. But uh, it, does, it is interesting to see that it probably did go substantially further than it does now. These are uh, various ways of depicting the uh, data using the uh, 
surveys that were done uh, by people on the ground and combining them with our EM surveys, I often find these black and white surveys to be the most revealing as to what things must have looked like at one time. These are continued uh, modeling of the uh, football field area, which shows the bedrock below, and of course the, uh, uh, the compacted football field on top of it with the construction uh, in the middle. So working in Egypt was a bit of a challenge. All of our gear had to be air transportable and field toughened because the conditions were pretty tough over there. We worked closely with Egyptians on all operations, mainly monitoring and security. Security varied from day to day and appears to have been directed by Zahi Hawass. Our residence was watched by an armed policeman 24 hours a day. Whenever we went to the plateau, an armed escort was called. It would usually lead us all the way to the uh, work site, but occasionally they would uh, turn one direction or the other at the end of the first block and disappear. Some days we were accompanied by a plain closed policeman all the time. Uh, all the time that we were away from our, uh, our, uh, our villa where we were staying. These are the tourist police mounted on camels and they carry machine guns and they watch all work that goes on in the sensitive areas. Every major intersection in the city has five policemen that have military men on duty 24 hours a day. Two of the five are constantly standing behind metal plates with machine guns. This metal plate has a, a gun port right there. There's another one on the opposite side. And uh, the men rotate through there, but there's always somebody behind those ready for action at any time. So they take their, seri their uh, security very seriously in Egypt. Inspectors. Uh, inspectors work directly for the ministries of antiquities and are responsible for police activities around the important sites in Egypt. Zahi Hawass was a, uh, an inspector at one time. People jump when the inspector gives instructions. Uh, as an inspector, an inspector was assigned to us and we were expected to have him with us for all operations. They supervise the tourist police and even approve or disapprove construction in areas of Cairo near the sensitive sites. With us was Inspector Reda Abdel Halim. He's an Egyptologist and a university graduate. He speaks seven languages. He also has a night job as a head waiter in an exclusive restaurant. <laughs> he has a wife and three children and an apartment in a car, which is a 1978 Fiat 128. <laughs> He's considered to be on the high end of middle class. The inspectors make 295 Egyptian pounds a week, which is about $48. I still communicate with uh, Reda by EM, uh, by email, but I haven't heard from him since the Arab Spring. I've seen him make wildly arbitrary decisions about building construction and I suspect that he may have had enough enemies to drop in from favor with the revolutionaries, and I suspect he didn't survive. The archaeological mission hires 10 laborers to help with chores uh, that are being done. This is common labor, carrying boxes, shoveling sand, moving rocks, and serving tea. Although none spoke any English, they were probably not educated they were, seemed like they were pretty smart and had no trouble learning to assemble and care for our equipment. The instrument is assembled with fiberglass bolts requiring precise torque settings. They were always done right and the work was always checked by the leader, who's a guy in a long white. And I have to say that they were superior to our trained crew as far as assembly work. They did a good job. They live in a tent on the site where, of the pyramid uh, builders, where the pyramid builders lived. So this is the soccer field over here. This is where the pyramid builders once lived. This is where these guys lived. 
Most are from an area which is more than 50 kilometers away, and they go home only when the digging season is over. Digging season lasts six months. Most are related in some way. It's considered to be a good job and hard to get. They make 98 Egyptian pounds a week, a little less than $16. Well, this is my social awareness thing here. The elephant in the living room. In the center of the Giza Plateau is a Muslim cemetery. I couldn't find out how long it's been here, but it's clear that it hasn't been here for a long time. It's located at the mouth of the Wadi, between some of the most sensitive historic sites. No one suggests that it covers any archaeological site at this time. Uh, because it's uh, in the mouth of the Wadi, an area that's been savaged by erosion and flesh over the century. So the worker area is behind it here, and I'm standing at uh, Menkaur's pyramid, the small pyramid. So it's directly between all those areas in the uh, Wadi. Unfortunately, the cemetery is full, but during the time we were there, we saw three to five funerals each day. They simply break down the wall and use some of the rock to build the needed tombs, and the remainder of the rock is used to rebuild a section of the wall further out. So here, the, uh, uh, this tree is over the Valley Temple from Menkaur's Pyramid. Uh, the cemetery wall is only a couple of meters away from overwhelming this site. So looking back the opposite direction, uh, the Valley of Temple for Menkaros Pyramid would be in this area right here. So I can only imagine the troublesome conflict, which is almost certain to happen uh, when these areas start to uh, cover up critical areas. And at this moment, it's less than 200 meters from the, from the uh, Muslim cemetery to the Sphinx. So you can see it's right in there close. It's a very large area. It's also quite beautiful too. This is the space, the base of the uh, base of the pyramid area. Well, that's my program. Thank you for coming to watch it. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, what, uh, when were you over in Egypt? This was in 2002. 2000, so 10, 10 years ago. Be 10 years ago now. Did you have some trouble taking photographs? Say again, please. Did you have some trouble taking photographs from your monitors? Uh, no, none at all. They were uh, very cooperative uh, with photographing. They were willing to actually take us places to get photographs. We need to take photographs of their, uh, their police stations and their border, their checkpoints and so on? Yep. And that didn't seem to have any problem with that. Yes, sir. Do you have to know if any equipment used to take this Can you say that again, please? Uh, do you have to know if any of the equipment used to take this information was sent up to Mars? Uh, no. no. As far as I know, they're not using uh, any uh, electromagnetic equipment. They may be using ground penetrating radar uh, up there. Uh, the uh, ground penetrating radar can create some of these same types of images. Uh, we think the uh, electromagnetic techniques are better because we don't have to contact the ground, where uh, ground penetrating radar actually has to rest on the, the surface of the ground. And uh, another disadvantage of ground penetrating radar is that it can't see past the first crack, because all the energy uh, is reflected by the, the first crack, where EM equipment uh, permeates uh, infinitely, actually. It's just a matter of uh, how far away can we detect the signals 